The following program is brought to you by GM Defense, a division of General Motors of Canada Limited. Hello, I'm Gordon Vincent, Private Gordon Vincent. At least, that's what I was when, as a young man, I joined the Royal Canadian Regiment back in 1948. Today, I'm in the regiment's home station at Wolseley Barracks in London, Ontario, to commemorate a very special centennial for my regiment and for Canada. A regiment is a soldier's home within the Army. There are three regular force infantry regiments in the Canadian Army. The Royal Canadian Regiment was Canada's first, founded in 1883. Each regiment has its own traditions and customs, and each soldier forms a strong bond with their own regiment. Over the last 100 years, young Canadian soldiers in this regiment have served in wars and on peacekeeping missions around the world in many hostile places. Soldiers of the Royal Canadian Regiment have performed tasks the Canadian way, modestly, reliably, effectively, efficiently. They got the job done with quiet professionalism, without fanfare or hype. 100 years ago, Royal Canadians became the first to fight for Canada overseas. Today, at the beginning of the 21st century, the Royal Canadian Regiment's 1st Battalion is overseas once more, this time in Kosovo with exclusive footage of the regiment's peacekeeping missions and rare archival film taken 100 years ago, we will honor the legacy of the Royal Canadian Regiment in the 20th century. I'm standing in the Royal Canadian Regiment's museum at Wolseley Barracks. This is the uniform the regiment wore. And over the years, it has changed with the times. In the last few decades, Canada too has changed dramatically. The last 100 years of the Royal Canadian Regiment is a part of our remarkable history that can give us a clearer sense of our national identity and purpose. In 1899, Canada's Prime Minister, Sir Wilfrid Laurier, authorized the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Canadian Regiment for service in the Boer War in South Africa. This marked the first time Canada fought in a war overseas as an independent nation. But it wasn't the first time the Canadian soldiers saw action. In 1883, the Canadian government had finally established a small permanent force of regular soldiers, the Infantry School Corps. This was the beginning of what soon would become known as the Royal Canadian Regiment. Their first test came only two years later when they were called upon to help put an end to the Northwest Rebellion led by Louis Riel. This was the first time the Canadian regular troops went into action. The men who made up the first Canadian contingent to fight in the Boer War were drawn from the Royal Canadian Regiment of Infantry and from militia units across the country. Remarkably, in just 16 days after the recruitment order was given, the 2nd Battalion Special Service of the Royal Canadian Regiment of Infantry paraded through the streets of Quebec City and boarded the steamer Sardinian bound for South Africa. It was October 30th, 1899. Many of them had never traveled outside Canada and the chance to fight not only meant answering the call to duty, but to take part in an extraordinary adventure. Only four short months after leaving Canada with little training and only a few brief skirmishes under their belts, the troops of the RCR soon found themselves involved in what would prove to be the turning point of the war. In the valley of the Motor River at Pardeberg Drift, the Boers had dug themselves in on both sides of the towering riverbanks. Evicting them would not be easy. As artillery pounded the Boer positions, the Canadians advanced from the trenches when the time came for the final assault. 
On the night of February 26th, exactly 19 years after the Zulus had bloodily defeated the British at Majuba Hill, the Royal Canadian Regiment was holding the front line of the Empire. The advance began at 2.15 a.m., but a vicious barrage of enemy fire held them down. By dawn, they were near enough to open fire on the Boers, and the end came quickly, as the Boer Commandant, General Cronje, surrendered. This rare archival film footage of our young Canadian Army in South Africa shows us a little of what those soldiers endured and fought against. Pardberg was the first great victory for the Imperial forces and turned the tide of the war. 4,000 Boers had surrendered. The regiment soon advanced on Bloemfontein, then north, fighting their way finally to the outskirts of the breakaway Republic's capital of Pretoria. By the time the RCR embarked for home on November 7, 1900, 68 of its officers and men had died in service and 115 were wounded. Following the victory at Pardberg, the regiment received accolades from Queen Victoria and the British military. Believing that it could be cold for the fighting men in Africa, Queen Victoria had knitted woolen scarves as special awards for deserving soldiers. Only four of these scarves were ever presented. The Queen's scarf, awarded to Private Robert R. Thompson of the Royal Canadian Regiment, is one of the rarest honors ever bestowed on a Canadian. News of the Pardberg battle made headlines across Canada. It was a great source of pride for the regiment and for our young country. The gallant legacy of service by fine young Canadian men and women serving their country on foreign fields that began at Pardberg Drift has carried successive generations of young Royal Canadians into many dangerous places over the past 100 years. But despite the optimism of the time and the hopes that a new century would bring peace, security, and prosperity, the 20th century would emerge as the most destructive in history. Only 12 years after the end of the Boer War, the Western world would change forever. The assassination of Austrian Archduke Francis Ferdinand on June 28, 1914, thrust the world and Canada into a quagmire known as the Great War. In 1914, Canada was a young nation with a small population spread thinly along vast distances. But we accomplished what many thought was impossible. Some historians have claimed that after the Battle of Vimy Ridge, Canada became a country. Today, it may seem strange that a country should feel a sense of nationhood as a result of a military victory outside its own borders, but that battle is now part of Canadian lore. When the RCR arrived in Belgium in November 1915, no one not the politicians of the day, the soldiers or civilians, had any idea of the brutal and bloody battles that lay ahead for this generation of Canadian youth. Every community in Canada would be deeply affected by what soon became known as the war to end all wars. The images are well known, the trenches, the mud, gas, no man's land. After garrisoning Bermuda for nearly a year in June 1916, the Royal Canadian Regiment took over a portion of the front line in France. For these young men, and hundreds of thousands of young Canadians, it was the beginning of nearly three years of trench warfare, miserable and deadly. A fierce attack at Mount Sorel resulted in many casualties for the RCR. And it was here that the regiment earned its first battle honor of the Great War. <laughs> 
In the following months, the regiment took part in several more key battles along the front lines, many of them not successful and costly to the Canadian Corps. Then came Vimy Ridge, April 9, 1917. The Allied attack began on Easter Monday, with all four Canadian divisions attacking together for the first time. The Royal Canadian Regiment was in the left centre position and reached its final objective on the crest of the ridge only two hours after the attack had begun. Three days later, Vimy Ridge was secure. It was a brilliant victory, the first successful major offensive for the Allies since the beginning of the war. This victory brought Canadians a sense of pride and national identity that we had never known before. But it was costly. The Royal Canadian Regiment alone had lost 57 of its men. One hundred and fifty-five more were wounded and sixty-five were missing in action. Many feats of bravery and valor marked this great battle. Among them, a courageous effort by Lieutenant Milton Gregg, who despite his own wounds, staggered back to the regiment's front lines under heavy fire with a mortally wounded comrade. For his outstanding gallantry during the raid on Vimy Ridge, Lieutenant Gregg was awarded the Military Cross. The war was far from over, and the battle-weary, war-hardened men of the regiment faced the enemy again and again. During the advance through the Marcoing line near Cambrai, Lieutenant Gregg once more distinguished himself by crawling forward through severe enemy bombardment to find a way through the maze of entangling wire that circled the German defenses. He then led a small party of men into the enemy trench where they fought with bayonets and rifle butts and destroyed several machine gun nests. When a vicious counterattack ensued, Lieutenant Gregg, though seriously wounded, crawled back to his own lines for more ammunition, returning to lead his men in capturing the entire trench. For this extraordinary valor, Milton Gregg was honored with the Victoria Cross, the first to be won by a member of the Royal Canadian Regiment the highest award that can be won by a Canadian in action. The face of the war was ever changing as new destructive weapons and machinery were developed. Some of the fighting now took to the skies. This would mark the beginning of a new kind of warfare, but for the Royal Canadians, the fight was still very much on the ground, in the mud-filled trenches and across the devastated countryside. As the Allied forces slowly advanced their positions, the casualties of the war continued to rise. Finally, in November 1918, the Royal Canadian Regiment took part in a bold push forward beyond the trenches. It was open warfare now, and the advancing army met only sporadic resistance as the Germans retreated. The regiment suffered its last fatal casualties of the war on November the 10th, just outside Mont. A platoon came under attack from a concealed machine gun, killing five men. Lieutenant W. King, became the first Allied officer to re-enter the historic city and was asked to sign the Golden Book of Mans to mark the city's liberation. Within a few hours, a memorable message was received at the RCR headquarters. It is interesting to note that it was Lieutenant Milton Gregg, now the regimental adjutant, who received and immediately delivered the message to the regiment's commanding officer. In part, that message read, Hostilities will cease at 1100 hours, November the 11th. Troops will stand fast, online, reached at that hour. The Great War was over. The war affected everyone. The destructive capabilities of modern warfare had an impact not only on the battlefield, but also on civilians living in villages, towns, and cities. Although the great loss of Canadian life in the First World War affected virtually every family and every community across Canada, the country was left with a sense of pride, maturity, and accomplishment. Some would say it marked our emergence as a nation.
The political and emotional ties between Britain and Canada remained strong following the war. But Canada was growing into a modern, independent country. In post-war Germany, however, a powerful resurgence of nationalism was being fueled by bitterness and resentment over the loss of the war, the Versailles Treaty, and the effects of the Great Depression. In Europe, the storm clouds of war soon appeared on the horizon again, as Germany rearmed itself and invaded Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Poland. They would eventually sweep across Western Europe, occupying France, Belgium, and Holland. On September 10th, 1939, Canada declared war on Germany for the second time in 25 years. The images of young Canadian soldiers boarding trains and ships and waving goodbye were scenes that were still all too familiar. Of the 4,900 Canadians who went in on the Dieppe beach, less than half returned to England. But the Royal Canadian Regiment, like most of the Canadian Army, would wait and train for three and a half years in Britain. It was not easy for the regiment to be constantly training for battle, but never fighting. And the years seemed to be an endless routine of marches and drills. The men were hungry for the real thing, or at least something that would break the monotony and help them contribute to the war. Finally, on July 10th, 1943, the Royal Canadian Regiment landed at Pacino in Sicily. The months of planning, the constant training, and the diligent study of maps, aerial photographs, and models of the assault areas all paid off. The RCR's first objective was to seize Pacino Airfield, and each member of the regiment, down to the lowest private, knew the precise timing of each phase and his exact job during each engagement. The regiment moved on foot up the Sicilian coast, and it was near the town of Valganera that the troops of the RCR first encountered German soldiers the enemy that they would face throughout the rest of the war. Again, the regiment pushed on, now fighting its way through Asoro, Nizoria, and Regobuto. Town after town and village after village succumbed to the combined Allied military assault. The battle for Sicily was to last from July 10th, 1943, to the beginning of September. Then, 18 more long months fighting their way up the Italian boot as part of Montgomery's 8th Army. The Italian campaign was to be one of the most vicious of the war, and our soldiers would distinguish themselves in a series of battles that saw them fight in places like Campobasso, San Fortunato, and Ortona. Street by street, the towns were occupied by the advancing army. Mile by mile, the Italian countryside gave way as the opposing forces retreated, overtaken prisoners. The Royal Canadian Regiment pushed north until finally, the war in Italy ended. The Canadians alone took more than 12,000 German prisoners. At least eight enemy divisions were destroyed, and 16 more suffered disastrous losses. At the end of the Italian campaign, the RCR joined the newly formed 1st Canadian Army in Northwest Europe. Here they traveled overland to link up with their comrades of the 1st Canadian Army. Britain's Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Finally, the moment of reunion arrived. Their old friend, Field Marshal Montgomery, drives out to meet them. Their old CO of the 8th Army and their new commander of 21st Army Group greets them as one veteran warrior to his pal. The whole great movement is completed in an unbelievably short time. Four days for the trip through Italy, 24 hours on the water, and five days on the road to Holland. Now the 1st Canadian Corps joins the 2nd to add their force to the final blow.
off point for the Rhine Drive becomes a mighty storehouse. The war was nearing its end, and the RCR's role in Holland was thankfully not to be a long one. Through April and May, the fighting continued, but German resistance was failing. Still, many casualties were suffered in those last few weeks, among them Captain F.J. Sims, who had just taken over command of D Company. Captain Sims was the first member of the RCR to land in Sicily, going in as part of a mine-clearing party. Sadly, Captain Sims was also the last Royal Canadian Regiment member to be killed during this conflict. Finally, the long list of battle fatalities had come to an end. The e day breaks, and they triumphantly watch as the On Lunenburg Heath, Germany surrendered on May 5th, 1945, and the war was over. 1,270 Royal Canadians were wounded, and 370 were killed in action. Sashenkwas, the hated Nazi governor of Holland, is captured. General Blaskovitz is arrested as is the first war criminal to be tried by a Canadian court, Brigade Führer Kurt Meyer, Charged with being responsible for the shooting of Canadian prisoners of war under his charge, Meyer is later in the year convicted and sentenced to be shot. They also know the joy of being released... As the world country. celebrated, many of the fighting troops could not believe that after six years, it was over. But for some, the end of the war meant freedom. Freedom from the slow death of the war camps. What was the life like in the, in the camp? Oh, it's a uh, pretty grim affair. The Germans don't do any more for us than they have to. Uh, life could have been happier if they'd have got Red Cross supplies to us, but they refused to lay down transportation for them, and as always, we just starved to death the last few months. Across the sea in Canada, victory is celebrated from coast to coast. After the war, some of the regiment went back to Canada as army trainers, and some stayed in Europe as part of the force of occupation. There was great determination not to repeat the disastrous consequences of two world wars. And the formation of the United Nations was a response to that desire. In 1945, 50 countries signed the United Nations Charter. The idea of global collective security was evolving. During the Second World War, the Soviet Union was an ally to Western states. But as they occupied Eastern Europe after the war, the Soviet Union was not retreating or demobilizing. And they now posed a threat to Western Europe. The Soviet Union began to cut its citizens off from the West. An iron curtain had been drawn. The world was divided again, this time between East and West. The Korean War is often described as Canada's forgotten war. There's no forgetting the 560 casualties suffered by the Royal Canadians that saw service in that war. On June 25, 1950, North Korea sent troops together with Soviet tanks and aircraft across the 38th parallel and into South Korea. The invasion took Western countries completely by surprise. The Korean Peninsula had been under Japanese control since 1905. By the end of the Second World War, China, Britain, and the United States had promised Korea's independence. However, the Yalta Conference in 1945 gave the Soviet Union a sphere of influence in Korea. The Soviets took swift advantage. In support of the United Nations objective, Canada sent warships and troops, including the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Canadian Regiment, Canada's forgotten war had begun. The troops of the Royal Canadian Regiment landed at Pusan on May 5, 1951. The front of the war between North and South had finally been stabilized and ran across the country not far from the 38th parallel. It was on this unfamiliar battleground of rice paddies and sharp ridges that the men of the RCR found themselves up against a tough, dedicated and experienced enemy the Chinese. Fierce raids and deadly patrols, many taking place at night, 
mark the coming months. The regiment's first major engagement was at Chai Lai on May 30th, 1951, where they suffered 31 casualties in taking the village, only to be ordered to withdraw because their position was too isolated from support. The RCR was engaged in several offensive operations during 1951, including Minden and Commando, where the UN positions were slightly improved. But for the most part, the fighting in Korea was a frustrating affair of small gains that were too often soon lost back to the enemy troops. In early November 1951, Chinese troops attacked positions held by A and C companies of the RCR on Hill 187. The regiment's 2nd Battalion was in the center of the 25th Canadian Brigade as wave after wave of Chinese infantry came in through gaps blown in the wire. They quickly cut off a platoon and the fight that followed was chaos. Lieutenant E.J. Mastronardi, a platoon commander, had his flare pistol shot out of his hand and when his revolver jammed, he managed to wrench a gun from a dying Chinese soldier and carried on the fight. In the thick of the battle, Private Johnny Johnson calmly field stripped two malfunctioning Bren guns and put both of them back into action. It was Johnson's first day in the line. That attack on Hill 187 was the beginning of a month-long campaign by the Chinese to push the UN troops back and recapture some of the ground lost in earlier fighting. As each side in the war would attempt to improve their position, the heavy guns would crash, tracers would light up the sky, jets would spread napalm through the hills, and men would die. And while the men waited, suffered, and died, the United Nations and North Korea engaged in seemingly endless discussions over a ceasefire. The war in Korea was very different from the great war in Europe of only a few years earlier. Then, all of Canada had been affected by the fighting overseas, but not now. Most Canadians in the early 1950s were trying to get on with their lives. Perhaps that is why the Korean War, or as it is officially known, the Korean Police Action, is often called our forgotten war. In April 1953, the 3rd Battalion was guarding Hill 187 near the Jamestown Line. Suddenly, Chinese artillery fire opened up. In the valley that lay between the RCR's positions and those of the Chinese, 16 members of the regiment had been sent to set up an ambush in no man's land. They now spotted Chinese infantrymen moving towards the Canadian positions and opened fire. The Chinese answered back. When the platoon commander was shot and killed, Corporal Joseph McNeil, second in command, began to move the men back. While the men in the valley struggled to survive, the Chinese barrage shifted to the rear lines and Chinese infantrymen began to pour through, penetrating the RCR defenses. Firing and throwing grenades, they began pulling dazed Canadians to take as prisoners. Lieutenant Edgar H. Hollier tried several times to size up the situation but was always forced back by attacking Chinese or bombs. Finally, he succeeded in radioing for proximity shell fire on his own position, and soon thousands of shells began to rain down on the Chinese troops. Hollier and his men managed to move out, and a short time later, he led a new company back to reoccupy the position. They came under heavy Chinese mortar fire, but eventually held the position, and the Chinese withdrew. The killing stopped the night of July 27, 1953, when an armistice agreement was finally signed. The last Royal Canadian left Korea in March of the following year. The Royal Canadian Regiment's three regular battalions rotated in and out of Korea between 1951 and 1954. In doing so, they earned the regiment's 54th battle honor. Despite Canada's contributions, the Korean War became the Forgotten War. It was only a few years after the Second World War and many Canadians were tired of war. They wanted to get on with their lives and participate in a dynamic post-war economic boom. Also, Canada's military contribution was relatively small compared to the two world wars, and the conclusion of the Korean War seemed indecisive. But of 117 Royal Canadians did not come home from Korea. As the Korean War wound down, the Cold War heated up and Canada committed a brigade group of soldiers to service with NATO in Germany. Initially, with the British First Corps in the north and from 1970 with the American-German-based Central Army Group, a Canadian battalion group was also earmarked for deployment on NATO's northern flank as part of the Allied Mobile Force land. For more than 40 years, generations of Royal Canadians, fathers and sons, 
served as part of Canada's contribution to the Cold War effort and other places around the world. In the troubled Middle East, Canadian soldiers still represent the interests of peace. Prior to 1992, a Canadian infantryman's service would likely take him to Germany with NATO and to Cyprus as a UN peacekeeper. Responding to the political instability and civil unrest, the regiment proudly fulfilled their country's commitment to world peace in many dangerous corners of the world, such as Cyprus, Somalia, and the Gulf War. By 1992, Canada was winding up these contributions as it appeared some measure of stability was coming to the world. However, as the Soviet Union collapsed, so did one of its most stable satellites, Tito's Yugoslavia. Where do you come from? Canada! Today, reserve soldiers drawn from the 4th Battalion have joined the 1st Battalion over in Kosovo. When we return, Exclusive footage from this peacekeeping effort. In the early 90s, trouble in the former Yugoslavia prompted the regiment to take on peacekeeping roles in Bosnia. To this date, the United Nations has called upon Canada to serve missions in this devastated part of the world. Right now, soldiers of the 1st Battalion of the Royal Canadian Regiment are in Kosovo. They will be the last Canadian unit to serve there. Unfortunately, it is not because peace has come to that troubled area. Each day in Kosovo begins with detailed briefings, affectionately known as morning prayers. So with that, let's start. Commanders report on events of the past 24 hours, discuss on ongoing problems in the area, and outline the day's assignments and duties. On dog route at grid 992-161 at 940, there was a road traffic accident involving two civvy vehicles. Uh, there are no casualties, and when they drove by, there were actually no occupants. There's nothing further to report on that. The, the one I share about a group just arrived here in Kosovo approximately uh, six weeks ago. Myself, Sergeant Paris, I'm part of the uh, mortar platoon within the battle group, and we have three tasks within our platoon. One is to conduct uh, both vehicle and mounted patrols by day and by night. A typical day for the men of the regiment's 1st Battalion involves routine inspections along the main roads. Although peace has come at last to this troubled area, there has been vast destruction. And as 1,000 people a day return to their devastated homes, there is much to do. The reminders of war are everywhere, from the minefields to the bombed-out buildings to the relics of the weapons of war. 
In addition to the large humanitarian aid that the regiment is helping to deliver, there are also the small favors to be done every day. Often, a helping hand is all that is needed to make life a little easier. Without this help, a ditched car can be ravaged overnight. Many of the families in this war-torn area are still without shelter. They live in tents or temporary shelters supplied by the regiment until their houses can be rebuilt. We have now stopped in the town of the Puznik, uh, where you can see off to your left, you see a small mountain range, and on the other side is another mountain range uh, as well. To my understanding, throughout the war, this area here of the Puznik was heavily, heavily mined. And um, throughout, right now, it stands the only cleared route in around this area is the road that we're on. When we're patrolling throughout the town, we have to like, um, utilize our extreme caution when we're doing our patrolling, as it is one of probably the most dangerous areas in uh, the Royal Canadian Regiment's area of operation here. Deadly landmines are everywhere, and there are only a few safe passages from one region to the next. Many of the main roads are heavily damaged by vehicles that have strayed a little too far over and into the danger zone. Here, British engineers assess the damage from landmines that have blown part of the road away. However, there is little that can be done until spring arrives and the ground thaws. The urban centers of Kosovo are faring somewhat better. Local merchants are rebuilding their shops while others have already opened their doors for business. However, the source of some prosperity is to be questioned. Uh, vehicles such as uh, Range Rovers, any other sort of uh like an upper-class vehicle, like a shiny new vehicle. We're a little suspicious of, but we're wondering who the occupants are. Uh, it could be any sort of uh, important person of, of some sort. So we, we sort of tend to keep an eye on them, look at license plates. There are a lot of illegal license plates, though. So they could belong to any sort of various organizations. So those are uh, attention that that's something that we especially pay attention to. This right. area we call, uh, we call it Tent City. Yep. Well, this is it's, uh, set up by an NGO uh, for children who have experienced some sort of trauma during the war. And they, they come here, about 1,200 students of various ages come here and receive uh, treatment for the various traumas that they've experienced. It's uh, 600 students in the morning and 600 students in the afternoon. And it runs from Monday to Friday, so they get their weekends off. And it goes from age, uh, from age four up to age 16, 17. some of the wood and then after that we're going to take up and go up to Tresnik. The regiment is focusing its efforts on rebuilding the homes of the people of Kosovo. Here in Tresnik West, the Joko family gets news that their home will be rebuilt in a few days. So within about, uh, we'll say about a week, you should have a roof over your house. Monday, you'll be here. Take a look at this. And they'll start probably to. Yeah, 
while stopping to help a villager pull his precious cargo of roof shingles off this dangerously icy mountain road. The soldiers of Duke's company are delivering their own precious cargo to the people of Tresnik East. Stoves and clothing. Okay. What I have here is uh, I have some stoves and uh, some other things uh, sent down. So we're going to just put them down right here and then you can pass them out to the people that need it. And I'm proud of the regiment, what the regiment does, what it stands for. In particular, the Royal Canadian Regiment has a model never pass a fault, and that is exactly what the soldiers in this regiment uh, believe, and that's what they practice. If there's a problem, we'll stop, assess it, and uh, sort the problem out with all turning the other way. Pro Patria. For the people of Kosovo, the presence of these Royal Canadians has made a world of difference to their lives. The RCR's legacy continues to grow as these soldiers pass on the proud honours and traditions of Canada's 1st Regiment. The men who serve and who have served with the RCR have influenced and affected the lives of people all over the world. Their dedication has gained them many awards and honours. But perhaps the biggest reward that the men of the regiment take with them wherever they go is the respect the Royal Canadian Regiment has earned, which is recognized in every action, big or small, in everything they do. In a moment, we'll conclude this special anniversary presentation. This monument honors soldiers of the Royal Canadian Regiment who gave their lives on behalf of Canada in places such as Pardberg, Mont, Vimy, and Ortona. Foreign places, but places that remind us of what the RCR contributed to earn the freedoms we enjoy today. The regiment began the 20th century serving Canada on foreign soil in South Africa. And for the next 100 years, the Royal Canadian Regiment represented Canada in conflicts, wars, and peacekeeping duties around the world. Its soldiers have provided relief for those suffering from the ravages of natural disasters and those man-made, ever mindful of their obligation to Canada and the legacy passed to them by those Royal Canadians who have gone before. As the new century begins, what is in store for Canada's National Regiment? In what form will conflicts and threats to our security appear? Where will the Royal Canadian Regiment serve in the 21st century? No matter where they are, the regimental motto will always guide them. Pro Patriot, for country. Thank you for joining me. I'm Gordon Vincent, Private Gordon Vincent.
I'd like to say uh, hi to my mom and dad in uh, Whitehorse, Yukon, and uh, my girlfriend in Owen Sound. Well, I'd like to say hello to my family in Newfoundland and my fiance in uh, Petawawa, Ontario. I love you. Hi to uh, all my loved ones, to my parents back from Markstown, Ontario, and to my lovely wife, Linda, my two kids, Robert and Chyla. I want to say hello to uh, my mom and dad uh, up north in uh, northern Ontario. I want to say uh, uh, I love, uh, send my love to uh, my fiance, Heather, and to all my friends. In closing, I'd just like to say uh, hi, mom and dad, back in Regina, Saskatchewan, and all my friends. We Stand on Guard has been brought to you by GM Defense, a division of General Motors of Canada Limited.